posts all over the country, from Fort Lewis, Washington, from Fort Ethan Allen, Vermont, 7,000 from New York, 7,000 from Georgia, 12,000 from Texas, some by train, some by motor caravan, some by air. Two skeletonized army corps, 70,000 men, were gathering in full strength and with full combat equipment. And from Detroit came thousands of new motor trucks, wheels for the army, to the concentration points at San Antonio, Texas, and Columbus, Georgia. Tent cities suddenly appeared as we concentrated our forces for a practical field test of men and equipment under simulated combat conditions. It takes a lot of space and camp equipment to accommodate 70,000 troops in the field, but the tough tent can be a cantankerous animal. Watch this one. Give it one more pull, Jack. Oh, what's a guy to do? Famous infantry regiments with full packs and equipment moved into the concentration area. Press cavalry units strung their picturesque picket lines across the field. The mounts were bred for this service, strong, alert, in top condition. And with them came vanishing us, the bent back of the horseshoer, and the homely skill of this veteran trooper repairing his leather saddlebag. Long lines of tough army mules, men and mules. We must put wheels under them, because time, fast movement, mobility, are the most critical factors of modern defensive power. The feet of troops and animals can't keep up with motorized army objectives. Fresh from the motor truck production lines in Detroit came 7,000 new units, new wheels for the army, an impressive demonstration of what one far-sighted industry can do and do quickly to give us badly needed motorized mobility. In 1934, the first of these four-wheel drive trucks were built by a quantity producer, especially engineered and designed to army specifications and produced in quantity to meet the most rigid and extreme service requirements. Now, when great numbers of these units are needed, the design has been modernized. Wheels for a new kind of army, fast-moving, hard-hitting for national defense. Industrial and military experts are on hand. When it comes to putting wheels under men and equipment and taking them places with swift, safe efficiency, outstanding mechanical performance and rugged dependability, this is something we know all about. Spare parts and service facilities must be available, right in the field. And even this handsome big service station is on wheels. With typical efficiency, even spare fan belts are provided. The trucks are serviced, equipped with special brush guards, and the trucks are turned over to the regular army. No time is lost, from assembly line to immediate use in servicing the maneuvers of 70,000 men over 3,000 square miles of territory. Great supplies of food must be put on wheels and delivered at concentration points. Our quartermaster corps has no small task in feeding these hungry troops. Laymen seldom realize the magnitude of such a job. For these maneuvers, items like 10 carloads of potatoes must be delivered to personnel widely distributed in the field. Great quantities of fresh vegetables, milk, eggs and butter, tea and coffee, 45 carloads of meat alone, and beans and preserves, prunes, cereals, rice and sugar. A total of 177 carloads of food alone to be concentrated, mounted on wheels and delivered under any conditions to the troops for their daily subsistence. Never a military nation, yet our Army's development of combat equipment has kept pace with a swiftly changing world. And in its mobility and defensive power is the shield of our national life, the final bulwark of defense for all of us. 130 million men, women, and children. Here are the mechanized units, light and medium tanks and their supporting vehicles, equal to some of the mechanized equipment across the sea. More fuel than food was required in this field test. 199 tank carloads of fuel delivered in the maneuver area. Gasoline is pumped by hand through eight hoses like this, filling eight 10-gallon cans at one time. And it takes a man like Tiny there 
with a strong bank to toss them up and into the waiting trucks for delivery somewhere to the thousands of trucks operating in the area. Old tactical ideas are being revised in terms of greater mobility, greater striking power, and greater defensive power. New equipment for old. New techniques for old. Here's one of the trained men responsible for part of the job of building our new army. Typical product of a democracy, he enlisted as a private and rolled his own. What we must have is trained men and adequate equipment. Men like these combat team officers who are perfecting the performance of the new triangular or streamlined division. Smaller, faster, much more flexible. From the time the combat officers receive their instructions, the new division of 12,000 men can get underway in less than half the time required for the old World War Tank Division. War on wheels has grown into a fast-moving business where generals ride, privates ride. Instead of moving 15 miles a day as they used to do, these men and their defensive power can travel 45, 150, as much as 300 miles in a single day. No bands are playing. No flags are flying. But the difference between success and failure may be in the mobility of our army, our motorized defensive power. And now they roll. Uncle Sam's Army on Wheels. Past the initial point rolls our motorized army under the watchful eyes of its commanding officer. It makes a convincing demonstration of our new mobility, for it can transport its own supplies, tow its own artillery, carry its infantry and their terrific firepower from here to the maneuver area, not within a few weeks by forced marching, but within a few days they will be 800 miles away. Ahead of them go the reconnaissance cars, command cars, pickups and weapon carriers, and the big cargo and winch job, carrying men and supplies, men and guns. Even the kitchen is on wheels. No wood fire sends a telltale stream of smoke into the sky to attract the attention of enemy aircraft. These gasoline pressure cookers are smokeless, and each range cooks for 50 men in the field, or even en route to some destination miles ahead. A new half-ton four-wheel drive roll down the highway. The big one-and-a-half-ton four-wheel drives roll down the highway, through towns, across bridges, but they are still far from the enemy. No contact has yet been established, or you wouldn't see them running so close together. Out on the open highway again, distances between them are gradually increased to a minimum of 500 feet. This makes them extended targets for attack from the sky. Keep them rolling. Ammunition and weapon carriers troop transport, artillery carriers, rolling to the war game, 800 miles away. At the end of the day, trucks roll into the bivouac area, where the Army establishes a temporary base with all attached units present. Later, when contact has been made with the enemy, the various units will separate, controls will decentralize, and they will establish bases of their own. Under the protection of the trees go the big 155 howitzers, the fast radio-equipped four-man tanks called mechanized units because they are mobile fighting equipment, able to go anywhere under the skilled hands of a more powerful but horseless cavalry. Old Yellow Legs has become a new race of men, traveling on caterpillars instead of hooves, protected by armor plates, agile and fast-moving. In come the transports, thousands of them, helping to demonstrate new standards of mobility for our motorized army. Every bit of cover is used to conceal the equipment. But an army of this size takes up lots of room. Some of the pickup units, command cars and weapon carriers, run down slippery banks and, with all four wheels driving, move across and up on the other side. Ordinary truck or passenger equipment would never dare undertake missions that these men drive through without hesitation or feeling that they're doing anything unusual. For the Army on Wheels, this kind of performance is a must, a matter of daily routine. They call them monkey wagons because they'll do almost anything except climb a tree. 
able to go at will and at any speed the terrain permits. Each one that goes through digs the ruts deeper into the sticky gumbo. But go through they must, and go through they do. If one of them gets stuck, they know exactly what to do. The cable is thrown ashore and taken up the bank, attached to the nearest solid object, in this case, an old stump. The signal is given, and the truck unleashes a five-ton pull on the winch to help until the driving power of the wheels get traction. And there she comes, pulling herself out and up by her own bootstraps. This technique was developed by our Army engineers to pull other vehicles and themselves out of trouble, as well as for putting artillery in and out of desirable positions. Meantime, the parade goes on. More and more equipment rolls into the bivouac area. New trucks and rugged old-timers. A number of these trucks have been in this service since 1934. Fast combat cars equipped with two machine guns ready for action against street barricades. More trucks towing the big howitzers. Trucks and men. More trucks and more men. Approaches to this vital area must be defended. 30 caliber machine guns are set up in a hurry. Each man knows what to do and how to do it. In actual warfare, seconds may mean the difference between success or failure. For protection against aircraft, this almost completely concealed, rapid-firing 37-millimeter anti-aircraft gun is set up and made ready for action. This road would be ideal for a mechanized attack. But here comes the new 37-millimeter cannon on its pneumatic tire carriage, moving into action with speed. Eight men can easily handle this 900-pound piece, capable of firing two-pound shells through any light or medium tank armor at 1,500 yards. Each regimental headquarters company is equipped with six of these guns, capable of throwing 30 shots a minute, an effective answer to tanks moving in your rear or trying to cut your supply lines. Again, every effort is made to keep the equipment completely hidden from marauding eyes in the sky. While these anti-tank guns are going into place, Portable desks open up in the back of the command cars. Maps are studied. Orders are issued and passed along. The moving troops keep in constant contact with headquarters through this extraordinary new two-way pack type radio set, appropriately called the walkie-talkie. Now, with men and equipment in position and well camouflaged, our thoughts turn to other things. All day, the sun has been shining on the piney woods. Birds are singing and the air is sweet and cool and carries the welcome smell of good, hearty food. The handy gasoline pressure cookers are dismounted, and soon the men will hear the familiar note of soupy. You can have your bread any way you like in the Army, so long as you like it good and thick. But there's plenty of it. And these men have put in a long, hard day. They're hungry. It feels good to load up the old mess kit and wander off under a big tree and stretch out. Notice the camouflage on the truck in the background. This equipment will have to be cleaned up before inspection. But right now, everything is pretty profoundly satisfying. How about it, Sergeant? A nearby creek serves as a bathtub for the truck. This is a part of regular routine, aimed at keeping the mobile equipment in tip-top condition. The drivers bring their powerful four-wheelers down through the deep, soft sand and into the water. From one of the concentration points at Fort Benning, Columbus, Georgia, to the maneuver area in Texas is 750 miles. 40,000 men with full equipment were transported over these routes in motorized equipment in record time. Once in the maneuver area, anything can happen. Next morning, our motorized army rolls out of bivouac, 
able to take these great distances in its stride with disciplined efficiency, without hurry, and without wasting a moment. The great motor units come out, up onto the road, and turn their rugged noses toward the maneuver area, where far ahead of them, contact is now being established with the other Army Corps, acting as an opposing force. On the highway, passing a pile of fleet command cars, the trucks are rolling again. Through towns and cities rolls the army on wheels, stopping for nothing. Mile after mile like this in the same loose formation, constantly on the alert. Ten miles, twenty miles, fifty miles, a modern army on the march. It seems less dramatic than it really is. Compare this with the old-fashioned army, developing sore and aching muscles and lowered efficiency, while these men can dismount from the trucks and go into action at the end of a day with their striking power, their firepower, undiminished. It took years of experience, engineering skill, large production facilities, and the able effort of the men on the assembly lines to build these faithful carriers. Upon their mechanical reliability and their ability to do this job day in and day out under almost any kind of condition, upon their performance under service conditions, depends the mobility of our streamlined army of today. By night, giant searchlights feel out the black sky. 800 million candle power are concentrated in that dazzling beam of light which reaches far beyond the range of our greatest guns, like a questioning finger. And the long horns, like something out of Buck Rogers, are highly efficient sound detectors, teamed with the searchlight to locate the sound of enemy engines. Anti-aircraft guns to win well. The bombers are driven off, but not until they've destroyed an important bridge. Then the engineers work all night, building a bridge to replace it. By dawn, the last steel boats float swiftly into position, and the finished bridge is one of the largest ever built in peacetime. It measures 761 feet in length and is capable of handling 11-ton equipment, seven and one-half tons per bay, between each boat. Here come the trucks, rolling rapidly over rutted roads, weighted with supplies and equipment. Every driver is tense, but he knows the bridge will be finished in time. No time is lost. The engineers have completed their mission, the bridge is ready for use, and across it rolls our army on wheels. bridgehead like this must be defended against air attack, and formidable anti-aircraft guns are unlimbered and set up. Our newest type of height finder, similar but far more efficient than old-style range finders, is carried into position. It is coordinated with a box-like affair mounted just in front. This highly secret director can perform incredible mathematical calculations in a flash. The unit not only has eyes, it has ears, queer-looking, extremely efficient sound detectors. Protected by the ring of anti-aircraft guns, the big 155s are moving beyond the bridgehead. As they are being towed into position, the trucks are streaming through, backing them up with ammunition and supplies. Even the guns move on rubber tires in our modern motorized artillery regiment. In this exposed position, the big guns must be camouflaged to hide them from observing eyes from the sky. One by one they take their place, facing an unseen enemy somewhere a dozen miles away. An efficient army hand generator is set up for operation on the front. One man operates the generator, and the other taps out the message on the shortwave radio with a greater range than the walkie-talkie. This installation will be used for directing artillery fire. Still greater range has this portable radio mounted in the body of a truck. With its own generator, the signal corps can send voice for 35 miles, code for 50. Meanwhile, telephone lines. A complete communication system is being established by the signal corps. Regular telephone lines are laid with all possible speed. All the equipment is brought up in trucks from which wire is run along the ground, later to be strung along trees down the road, while the truck proceeds to lay miles of wire. Each division has 120 miles of wire. Communication is of tremendous importance, for once attack or defense lines are formed, Movement must be guided and coordinated through a vast network of communication facilities. 
Only through great efficiency and flexibility in communication can there be concerted action. Information from field telephones like this, rigged in a hurry, go through a regular switchboard on the telephone central truck and are connected with combat field posts in a nearby village. Important information is exchanged. A connection is made with another field command post closer to the front, which is in turn relayed to the big gun. Ahead and above the guns are two observers in the basket of an observation balloon in constant communication with the ground. New order. The balloon is to be taken down at once and moved to a more desirable location. The men take a last look at the horizon and then are lowered slowly, pulled down by a cable. On the ground, the basket is replaced with a powered gondola, which allows it to move freely across country. The gondola is made fast. The engine is self-stopping. And without waiting to warm it up, the balloon takes off. The ground crew will follow later with the basket and the portable equipment in front. At the selected landing field, men are waiting. One of them carries a portable wind stop because these balloons must land into the wind like an airplane. Down it comes for a fast, perfect landing, only possible through expert coordination between pilots and the men on the ground. Infantry is streaming along both sides of the approaching road. With supporting equipment, it is these files of men on foot who can take and hold the ground. Ahead of them go the units of the lightning attack. Past their own combat post go the four-man tanks. A driver, radio operator, and two gunners in constant touch with headquarters by radio, for they, with attacking aircraft, are the spearhead of the war of movement. While the roads are still available, they forge relentlessly toward the front, only waiting direct contact before unleashing their terrific hitting power. Behind them, not yet under fire, come the supporting motorized infantry and a motorized battery of 75. The battery turns down a side road and goes into action. Modernized, these 75s have a range of almost 8 miles, and their mobility makes them effective under the high-speed conditions of modern war. While the batteries are going into position, a new civilian warning service is getting its first test. Each square represents a 16-mile area, where civilian observers under the direction of the American Legion are watching for enemy aircraft. From observation points like these, towers in a CCT camp, men with high-power field glasses are scanning the skies. Reports of what they see are written on forms provided for the purpose. The observer turns to his telephone and sends specific information back to headquarters. This information is coming in from a network covering the central and southern part of the United States. Long lines of operators receive the news of any aircraft movement. They pass it on to the operator at the switchboard who turns on lights showing the path of the enemy aircraft on the other side of the big map. Speed, altitude, and types of approaching planes are shown on this smaller control board, which flashes this information on the other side to the commanding officers. Two bombers are approaching, flying low and in an easterly direction. Their progress is watched on the big map, and something new in a warning service is being successfully pioneered in this bulletless peacetime exercise for preparedness. The approaching thunder of attack from the air drives this motorized column from the road. 50 caliber machine guns sit back in the truck in the foreground. Troops scatter from open road positions. The aircraft guns are in position to repel aerial attack and reconnaissance. Every available piece of artillery is being used to support the attack. Smooth bore mortars with curved fire and remarkable accuracy are throwing their gas shells right into the enemy lines across the way. Smoke pops burst on a nearby hill to blind the approaching tanks and screen our own counterattack. And here they come, lunging at high speeds over the rough ground, belching, lurching, deadly medium and light tanks, preceded and supported by bombers and head copying A regular army experiments with a mechanized attack, crushing speed and striking power. Here is a realistic imitation of disastrous, swift, fluid, modern combat. The aircraft and artillery firepower is followed by these mechanized units with their high maneuverability and speed. But it is the infantry that must take and hold the ground. Under fire, they are highly trained to follow the slashing attack of the tank. To cover them and the tank, artillery is laid down the barrage ahead of their advance. They consolidate their positions with guns pouring out insulating fire against the threat of counterattack. Everything is now concentrated on the infantry advance. 
A fast-moving battery moves into a better position to accomplish their mission of breaking up enemy concentrations and communications. Far ahead of them, their target, a small but important bridge, has been technically destroyed. The bridge is out. Then the army must cross without the bridge. First across is the Agile Command car, which is replacing passenger cars in the army. Next comes a big one-and-a-half-ton cargo truck, ferrying a reconnaissance motorcycle, unable to cross in any other way. One by one, the heavily loaded carriers drive into the deep-shifting sand bottom and fight their way up the opposite bank, 